His great love, I've learned the meaning of salvation out of His great love. Out of His great love, He picked me up, set my feet on sturdy rock. Out of His great love, I've learned the meaning of salvation out of His great love. I had gone astray, I lost my way when I called upon His name. Then He rescued me, now the song I sing. What a loving God is He. His great love, He picked me Good morning, church. It's great to see everyone in the house of the Lord today. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, thank you so much. It is out of his great love that we're here today. We're so thankful for your love, Father. We're so thankful for your care. We're so thankful, Lord, that we're able to be in a house of worship to worship the one true living God. We ask that you would prepare our hearts to receive your word to listen to Brother Doug as he brings the message today, for Derek as he leads us in music, and may we be transformed by the power of your word. We ask this prayer in Jesus' name, amen. I am thankful for my case. I am thankful for my family. I am thankful for deer hunt and blood riding. I am thankful for the Lord. I am thankful for God, my church, my family, my friends, school, pets, my mom and dad, Rennie and Pops, and especially my cell phone. I am thankful for my relationship with God and my mom, my dad, my family, my shelter, my school, my teachers, and especially this time of year, I'm very thankful for Christmas tree cakes. I am thankful for my family and sports. I'm thankful for my church and my family. I'm thankful for my sister, even though she's annoying, and I'm thankful for my amazing parents. I'm thankful for God's grace. I'm thankful for my church family. I'm thankful for a wonderful uh, home life we have, and I'm thankful for our beautiful family. I'm thankful for the baby camera. I'm thankful for my family and my good hair.
like that. I'm thankful for my beautiful hair too, Miles, that's awesome. Isn't it wonderful to be able to be thankful? Let's all stand, we're gonna sing Victory in Jesus. Let's sing. I heard an old, old story about a Savior and His glory. I heard about His groaning, of His precious blood on the And I repented of my sin and won the victory. Let's sing, oh, victory! Scripture says, in all things give thanks, for this is the will of God concerning us. In this Thanksgiving season, we want to share a song with you today simply called Thankful. What we still can't see 
it's up to us to be the change and even though we all can still do more there's so much to be thankful for There's so much sorrow It's way too late to say I'll cry tomorrow Each of us must find the truth It's so long overdue so for today we pray for what we know can be in every day we hope for what we still can see it's up to So much to be thankful for Even with our differences There is a place we're all connected Each of us can find each other's So for today, we pray for what we know can be in all this day. We hope for what we still can see. Father, we thank you. We, thank you. we have so much to be thankful for that oftentimes we look around and we complain about things. But if we look on the other side to see how, how you've blessed us and how you've been good to us, how we're not promised another day, but you give them to us anyway. We're so thankful for that. For this we give you praise. Bless our pastor as he brings the words of life allow our ears to receive what the Spirit has for the church. And we will forever be thankful and give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen.
He restores my soul and leads me on for His name, for His great name. Surely goodness, surely mercy, right beside.
Good morning, church. The scripture says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. And I hope that you're glad to be in God's house this morning. I know that I am. And I want to take just a moment to welcome those watching by means of television or other various means of social media. We appreciate so very much you tuning in to worship with us each week. We're continuing today in a series of sermons entitled God's Gold Mine Spiritual Nuggets from 1 Peter. For the past several months, we have been extracting spiritual nuggets from one specific vein of God's gold mine. That vein is the book of 1 Peter. This morning, we should be prospecting for spiritual nuggets in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 through 22. If you have your copy of the Word of God, follow on, please, as I read these words the Lord led Peter to place in this section of God's gold mine. For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit, through whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison, who disobeyed long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also, not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. From 1986 through the year 2001, I served as a senior pastor of Calvary Baptist Church in Waynesboro, Mississippi. One of the ministries sponsored by this church was a weekly worship service conducted at Restful Acres, a convalescent home where many of our members of our church and community resided. This service was held early Sunday morning before our regular scheduled time of worship on our church campus. So early on Sunday morning, uh, various members of our church staff, some of our deacons, as well as a few of the young people from our student ministry would make our way to Restful Acres. When we got there, we'd go to various rooms and we would assist some of the residents in making their way down to the large gathering room where we would have our time of worship. Most of the people were not very mobile, so we would push their wheelchairs down to the gathering room. Once everybody was in place, we would sing a few familiar hymns. And once those pre-selected hymns had been sung, the worship leader would typically ask, is there anybody here who would like to make a special request, maybe a favorite hymn? And as soon as he asked that question, one man, the same man, every Sunday morning would shout out, sing victory in Jesus. Well, this must have been his theme song because he wanted that song every Sunday morning. So you try to picture this scene in your mind. Here's a man in his late 80s. He had been there for more than two decades. He seldom received any guest. He couldn't stand up, much less walk. He had to go everywhere in his wheelchair. But in spite of the difficulties that he faced on a daily basis, this man had a sweet spirit. And you could tell from the twinkle in his eyes and the sound of his voice as he bellowed out this old hymn that he was a man who believed that there was victory in Jesus. Well, victory in Jesus is the message that echoes from the section of God's gold mine we read a moment ago. The original recipients of this letter were people who had been introduced to and were rapidly becoming more familiar with tough times. It is interesting to note that Peter did not pull his punches. He didn't tell his congregation, I cheer up, things are about to get better. Instead, he was painfully honest with them. He related that in spite of your situation, things are going to go from bad to worse. But I want you to know that no matter what you face in life, remember this always, there is victory in Jesus. And so there are four major points I want to highlight from today's text for our consideration. Note first, the substitutionary death. As strange as it sounds, the first thing that Peter pointed out about victory in Jesus is the substitutionary death of our Lord. Notice how he begins, verse 18. For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. The more I look at the contents of this verse, the more I realize that this is one of the most powerful verses in the Bible. And it's a verse that we typically overlook. And so I want you to notice with me all the rich theology that is expressed right here. There's some great rich spiritual nuggets for us to pick up. We don't have to dig deep. They're lying right there on the surface. He will open our eyes, our hearts, and minds to receive them. So notice the initial words that he wrote. He said, for Christ died. 
Peter refers to Jesus as Christ. That's significant. The anointed one, the Messiah, the one God sent into the world to save people from their sin. And this salvation is made possible through the substitutionary death of Jesus Christ. And so we need to understand that these people of the first century, they've been waiting for the coming Messiah, the Christ, not just for years or decades, but for centuries. And the message that Peter wants them to grasp is, here he is, Jesus is the Christ. And after asserting that Christ died, I'm sure people would pause and reflect on the word died. You see, there was a rumor going around in the first century A.D. that instead of really dying, Jesus merely became unconscious on the cross. They removed his body, placed him in a tomb, and he later revived. That would have meant that Jesus was just human. But Peter said, no, Christ died. And Peter knew how Jesus died. He died a painful death. He died on the cross at Calvary. Crucifixion was the most painful form of execution known to man. And Peter was one of our Lord's original disciples, so he could speak with authority on the subject that Jesus really died. And now Peter wants him to know not only that Christ died, but the purpose of his death. He said, Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. Simply stated, Jesus died for sin. Not for his sins, but for our sins. The righteous for the unrighteous. The Apostle Paul addressed this same subject with these words recorded in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. And that's what Peter's talking about. The righteous for the unrighteous. And I want you to be sure you understand. Jesus is the righteous. You and I are the unrighteous. That's why we refer to the crucifixion of Jesus as the substitutionary death of our Lord. Jesus was our substitute. He died for our sins. Through his death on the cross, Jesus paid the penalty for our sins. And that's what the 8th century prophet Isaiah meant when he wrote these words. By his wounds or by his stripes, we are healed. I hope you're beginning to see the rich theology for Christ died for our sins, the substitutionary death of our Lord. And Peter pointed out, here's the purpose, to bring you to God. You see, the Bible teaches that our sin separates us from God. Unholy people like us cannot come into the presence of a holy God as long as our lives are stained with sin. And the only cleansing agent that can take away the stain of sin is the precious blood of Jesus. The old hymn writer got it right when he penned these words. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Jesus shed his blood for every person on this planet. Peter said, Christ died for sins for all. Notice the phrase, for all. The good news is you and I are included within the scope of those words, for all. Jesus died for us. And so I don't want you to just look back 2,000 years in history and think that Jesus died on the cross and that we are far distant and removed from that event. No, we pointed out a few weeks ago, when he was on the cross, you were on his mind. When he was on the Christ, cross, I was on his mind. It's a personal thing the painful death that Jesus experienced. And he did it for everybody. That's the good news. But there's some bad news here. And that is, not everyone for whom Christ died has allowed his blood to wash away their sin. By that I mean they've never acknowledged that they're sinners. They've never confessed their sin, repented their sin, and by faith received Jesus Christ as their personal Savior and Lord. And the Bible says, Christ died for sin for all to bring you to God. You know what that means? It means that without Jesus, we are separated from God and have absolutely no hope of heaven. Christ died to bring us to God, but he doesn't force us to come to God. We must choose for ourselves what we're going to do with Jesus. 
Several weeks ago, I had a conversation with a young man, 20 years of age, extremely bright, has made some very poor choices in his life. And I sat down and tried to talk to him about the Lord, but I immediately discerned that I was not getting through. He had absolutely no concept of faith. He wanted everything to make sense from a scientific perspective. And then I believe in what you're saying. But right now, I really just don't have any room in my life for the God of the Bible that you're talking about. Well, I saw him again this past week. And I asked him, how's it going? He responded, I've discovered that my way is not working out. I want you to understand something this morning. Everybody worships some God. The Bible says no man can serve two masters. But implied in that statement is, but everyone must serve one master. And we get to choose who we're going to serve. It may be the things of this world. We may make a God out of ourselves or of some other person. Maybe it's our hobby we worship. But everybody worships some God. But I want you to know that Jesus came to bring us to the God who created this world, who, who spoke this world into being. And it's an amazing thing to consider that Almighty God wants to have a personal relationship with a sinner like me and with a sinner like you. But the only way we can come to God is through Jesus Christ, who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And so when we think about the cross, don't ever overlook the substitutionary death that Jesus was your substitute, and that he died for you. This is a message that Peter warned his readers to learn, and this is a message that the Holy Spirit of God wants each of us to grasp this morning, the significance of the crucifixion, the substitutionary death of Jesus Christ. But there's a second thing Peter talks about, and that is the sermon delivered, the sermon delivered. Listen to what Peter wrote in the last line of verse 18, and then in verse 19. He was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit, through whom also he, that is Jesus, went and preached to the spirits in prison who had disobeyed long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. Now, I shared with you last week that from the beginning of human history, there has been a war raging between the forces of good and evil. There is a constant clash between light and darkness. And this was true during the days of Noah that Peter referenced in today's text. The Bible says that during that period of history, man's thoughts were only evil continuously. That is, Satan had planted evil thoughts in the minds of men, and men had decided that they didn't need God in their lives. They rejected him. And here's Noah who's preaching for 120 years. Let me be honest with you, church. There are times when I get discouraged and I'm not sure if my ministry makes a difference. Is anybody listening out there? Is anybody paying attention? Is anybody hearing God speak? And then I look at the life of Noah. He preached for 120 years and didn't have a single convert. But he kept on preaching. There have been multiple moments in history when it appears that God has lost that the people of the Lord have been defeated and that they have given up hope. This is a part of Satan's strategy. He tries to get Christians down and to keep them down. The crucifixion and burial of Jesus appeared to be the concluding scene in the story of the Savior. I can imagine that the Pharisees and Sadducees took great delight. They probably exchanged high fives and patted each other on the back. The Roman soldiers thought, well, at last we brought this matter to a conclusion. We won't have to worry with this Jesus anymore. The religious leaders thought that they could go back to church as usual. Even the family, friends, and followers of Jesus had given up hope. The demons of hell had decided to host a victory party. But before that party concluded, it was interrupted by an unanticipated and uninvited guest. 
That guest was Jesus. And Jesus came to deliver news that the forces of evil did not want to hear. He came to tell them that the story of the Savior was not over with the crucifixion and burial of Jesus. Read the epilogue. There is another chapter yet to be read. Jesus rose from the grave and he is alive. There is victory in Jesus. This is what Peter was talking about when he said that Jesus went and preached to the spirits in prison. The word preach that Peter used, the Greek term, means to announce or to herald. There was a practice common in the first century A.D. that when an army went off to war and they won the battle, that they would select a soldier to serve as the herald. He would proceed or go before the conquering army. He would run back into one of their cities and he would announce, we've won, we've won. Make way and prepare to welcome the conquering military hero. Our general is on the way. Well, Peter presents a picture of Jesus being the herald, the one to announce news. And Jesus goes to the prison where the evil spirits are residing, not to hell where people are residing, but to he's speaking to these evil spirits and he's saying, I want you to know that death was not the end. You need to know that Satan has lost because there is victory in Jesus. And this is the message. Whew, this is a message that needs to be proclaimed from every Christian church in the world today. We need to preach it, and we need to practice it. Make no mistake about it, 2020 has been a tough year. And I refer to that almost every Sunday because I want you to know that I'm aware that it's tough out there. We have witnessed a deadly pandemic. This is the first time in my lifetime and in your lifetime when the doors to our churches were closed. We've seen downtown areas in inner cities destroyed because there were people who took out their displeasure through rioting and looting. We have seen law enforcement officers told to stand down by city officials, even though they are being verbally and physically abused. Countless stores, restaurants, and even major corporations have closed. We've seen a Supreme Court nominee attack for her Christian values. We have witnessed a hostile election in which both candidates and support, supporters of each party have thought like cats and dogs and are still doing so. Most conservatives have lost confidence in the media and many voters have lost confidence in the integrity of the way votes have been cast and counted. Sadly, while all this is going on, Many Christians have cowered down like the disciples did following the crucifixion and burial of Jesus. And the sermon that needs to be shouted out from this scripture and from this sanctuary this morning is Satan may be winning a few battles, but the Savior has won the war. There is victory in Jesus. One of the symbols of that victory is highlighted in the next point I want to highlight. That is a symbolic deliverance. Notice what the scripture says in verses 20 and 21. In the days of Noah, while the ark was being built, in it only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Now, please note, Peter's not saying that baptism saves you. Instead, he's expressing that baptism is a symbol of the fact that you have been saved. One of the ways that we express and profess our faith that there is victory in Jesus is by being saved and then by being baptized. And I don't know if you've never been saved this morning, if you've never been baptized, but I want you to know, friend, if you're living here in despair, in disappointment, in depression today, there is victory in Jesus. Trust Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and Lord. Make a profession of faith and be baptized. Advertise to the world that you believe there is victory in Jesus. Why? He is your only hope. There is no other way. There is no other source of hope. It is only through the Lord that we find hope, and it is only through a relationship with Jesus that we gain entrance into the kingdom of heaven. And when we are saved and baptized, advertised in the world, we placed our faith in Jesus, then we become members of the winning team. This brings us to the fourth and final point I will mention, and that is the supremacy declared. Verse 22 makes this statement regarding the risen Redeemer. I want you to listen to it. Who has gone into heaven 
and is, is, is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. Now, if you're asleep, I want you to wake up and listen to the conclusion of this sermon. The Bible says that Jesus is at the right hand of God. And where he is, is where we are going one day. Amen? And so I want you to remember, my friends, when the going gets tough, and it does from time to time, there is victory in Jesus. If you lose your job, there is still victory in Jesus. If you face a financial failure and you don't know how you're going to pay your bills, you need to remember there is victory in Jesus. If you feel all alone that the world's too busy and everybody's forgotten you, you need to remember there is victory in Jesus. If you're watching today by some convalescent home and you're alone and nobody can come see you, I want you to be reminded there is victory in Jesus. If you go to the doctor and you're diagnosed with some serious illness, you need to remember there is victory in Jesus. If you go through a divorce, there is victory in Jesus. If you are struggling with alcohol and drug addiction, there is victory in Jesus. If you lose a loved one through death, there is victory in Jesus. And that's the message we need to proclaim today. There is victory in Jesus. I want you to stand to your feet right now. I want you to stand and we're going to sing together. We're going to declare to this community there is victory in Jesus. Lead us, Derek. One, two, three. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me. may be seated. I want you to leave today uh, humming that song. I want you to sing it when you're in the shower tomorrow morning. I want you to remember there is victory in Jesus because we are facing spiritual warfare and the devil's going to try to drag us down and keep us down. I want you to hear there, there's nothing wrong with getting down. There's something wrong with staying down. And, and we remember there's victory in Jesus. We can get back up. I don't know if it's just the way I was raised or what, but I've been involved in sports all my life. I'm not a very good loser but I'm an outstanding winner. I like to be on the winning team. And with Jesus, I'm on the winning team, and you are too. If you're looking for a team, we want to invite you to suit up here at First Baptist Church Natchez. It's an easy time to join our church. If you'll see a member of our church staff down front this morning, we'll give you a card. You can fill that card out and hand it back to us, and, and you'll be united with our church. I tell you, there are people looking for church homes, and I think the last six weeks, we have had 25 new members join. Let's welcome our new members. I mean, that's outstanding. In the midst of a pandemic, more and more people are coming to, to church and uniting with the church, and so we thank God for that. And if you're looking for a church home, we would love to have you here at First Baptist Church. You're welcome, and you're wanted here. And if I can help you with anything, you don't hesitate to contact me and, and let me know. I want to have just a quick prayer, and then Matt's going to come and introduce the video we're going to watch. Father, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your word today that reminds us there is victory in Jesus and that we are on the winning team. We praise you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Again, it's that time of the year where we're promoting our Lottie Moon Christmas offering. We've got a wonderful, special uh, celebration we're going to do on December the 6th for that offering. But before we do that, and, and as we promote this, I want you to take a look at this short video of a couple of our church members, and we'll hear from another church member later, but just take a look at these two church members and why they're giving to Lottie Moon Christmas offering. Why do I give to Lottie Moon? 
I give to Lottie Moon because my giving helps to send missionaries all over the world to reach and teach others to know who Jesus is and to worship Him. Lottie Moon is our opportunity to give to international missions and based on the biblical scripture, this is not optional, but this is our command. It's our chance to share our blessings that the Lord's given us with those around the world. I support Lottie Moon offering because um, I had a personal connection with my Uncle Kurt, who was a missionary over in Africa for three years. And so um, it's just kind of dear to my heart that um, international missions, that we can give to them and support the missionaries there. I support it because I want to help spread the gospel and um, help those missionaries be able to help tell more people about the gospel and the word of God. A hundred percent of the proceeds go to foreign missionaries. So let's support the gospel. Let's support these missionaries by giving this year to our Lottie Moon Christmas offering. All right. What a wonderful day. Hey, I, we have a visitor today. I just want to introduce her. This is Betty. That's Temperance's twin sister. Temperance comes to play for us and she lives in Oklahoma. So we're glad to have you here with us today. Let's all stand. What a wonderful message. Let's all sing together. Make us one. Let's sing. Make us one, Lord. Make us one. Let your love flow. Let your love flow. 